Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Awesome. All right. Uh, my name is Mary Jody Joyce. I'm assistant director of Booth Library at Davis Nelkins College here in West Virginia, and I will be facilitating this session. And the bios for each of the presenters are in your folder, so I'm not going to spend time with that. But each of the presenters will be speaking about 15, 20 minutes or so. We'll have questions and answers at the end of the session. And each of today's presenters will be presenting on various um, aspects of Pearl S. Buck in the context of China. I have my phone, I have it set for 80 minutes. <laughs> so um, we'll stay on time, although I've been just told we get a little extra time because we started a little late. So without further ado, Dr. Yao, would you like to get started? Good morning, everyone. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, it's uh, such a fine day, right? Okay. I'm very happy uh, to be here. And first of all, I, sh I should uh, like I would like to thank uh, Johnny Mingzi uh, and also uh, you know Jay and uh, Lisa for all kinds of help. And also, I would like to uh, thank the organizing committee for inviting me to present my paper here. Uh, okay. Well, my topic. Uh, is Chinese culture going global, right? Buddhist monks, mythological inspiration. Uh, you know, at the very begin beginning of this century, especially in these recent years, there has been a call for the going global on the part of the Chinese government. Uh, I'm not a government official, uh, I'm uh, only a scholar. So I would like to talk about uh, <clears throat> the topic uh, by kind of analysis of uh, Pubak's works, uh, some of her masterpieces, and also some of her nonfiction. Yeah. Well, uh, Chinese literature actually and a culture going uh, global has actually become a national strategy <clears throat> for China, hence the heated discussions about it. So far, a number of conferences and also forums have been held in China, and also uh, you know, scholars and administrators, they have made great contributions to the theory and practice of Chinese literature and culture going global. And some scholars and writers and sinologists uh, in and outside of China, they, they are invited to make joint efforts uh, to this pro project. Meanwhile, uh, some magazines, for, for example, Chinese Literature Today, edited by Howard Goldblatt, has been published, published. And many Chinese journals and magazines start to publish their English versions, English editions. So from those efforts, it is uh, for me, it's uh, very easy to see the kind of warmth and also the kind of enthusiasm on the part of the government, yeah. Uh, and also relevant institutions and professions, right. So in such a context, I think of uh, Pubak. Uh, it is, of course, very clear uh, Pubak wrote her novels and non-fictions in the past. But I think um, the meanings uh, could be still felt nowadays in China, right. And uh, so in this particular context. Uh, it's very significant, also very meaningful for us to discuss Kubak's writings, uh, and also about her mythological inspirations for the, for the Chinese culture and also literature going global. So my uh, talk, uh, talk will be divided into three parts. The first one is uh, introducing Chinese culture in her fictions. Uh, today we know when we come to see, uh, to think of uh, Pubak, we think of her as a novelist first, right? Uh, so. Uh, in introducing Chinese, uh, say, culture in her fictions. Well, we have a very famous Chinese uh, saying, right? The ancient Chinese said that grief and indignation, indignation, uh, indignation will produce poets, which brings out into the open the relations between an author's achievements and, he, and her, his or her identity. So far as Pubak is concerned, her cross-cultural writings arose, so to speak, from her indignation. Because before she took up her pain, a lot of Westerners were uh, very unfamiliar with China, the Chinese people and Chinese culture. And what was imprinted in their mind was some distorted images, together with some hearsay stories full of uh, <clears throat> wild fantasies and sometimes exaggerations. And in their imagination and cognition, China was uh, you know, mysterious, an evil country even, right? And Chinese people were out of reason and impenetrable. And in most Western novels and travel books about China, they were described as a kind of archetype. <clears throat> Men with long pig tails and women with bound feet, 
all skinny with runny noses and dirty, ugly faces. Their deeds are always connected with uh, theft, burglary, raping, plotting, and assassinations. So for centuries, this has been the image the Western mind has of the Chinese. So out of indignation, Pubak was determined to present the Chinese people and Chinese culture she knew and understood in a very compassionate way to the Westerners with her cross-cultural writings so as to get rid of the prejudices some Westerners have had about Chinese culture and people and also to help them see that Chinese people were not the unreasonable heathens. Instead, they also had their pleasure, anger, sorrow and joy and that they were the human beings with common humanity and living in, uh, uh, cultural in cultural traditions which were formed and kept over centuries. Equally valid and understandable, though different from the Western ones. So for Police Park, the criterion with which to define a nation's identity is not its uh, geographical location, nor its race, but its culture and collective consciousness. And to know China is therefore to know Chinese culture. So that's why in her writings of, no of novels, she uh, <coughs> introduced a lot of uh, Chinese cultural elements uh, in her writings. Uh, in such novels as uh, East Wind, West Wind, her first uh, novel, the conflicts between the old and the new are dramatically unfolded uh, in the traditional family. So in that novel, we have one example of uh, traditional family, right? And also another title that is Pavilion of Women. Uh, it has a film version. Well, it tells a story about an extended family of property in which the three generations plus servants, more than 60 members in all, move back and forth. Another, another novel in Kingfolk. Uh, Pearl Buck describes for us another traditional family, though the, this time the entire family live in the United States in the beginning. Chinese cultural elements are abundantly exhibited. So a short story collection, The First Wife and Other Stories, also represents Pubak's efforts in this aspect. So because in this short story collection, especially in the first story, uh, that is the first wife, <coughs> we have uh, one portrayal of the uh, you know, a traditional Chinese family uh, in which uh, you know, uh, the family members were living in a transitional period. So old and new, uh, they are fighting against, against each other. So Pubak understands that Chinese families are the foundation of all social life in China. Of course, this is true of other cultures, but Chinese people pay, paid a lot of attention to uh, the peace and prosper, uh, prosperity of, chi of families, right? Well, that's why the very first sentence of the good, the good Earth, I think all of you are very familiar with this novel, right? It begins with, it was Wang Long's marriage day. Uh, so this is a typical, uh, you know, element in Pubak's writings. A new family is thus going to be set up. Uh, so this is a first, uh, the novel, uh, because uh, you are very familiar with this uh, novel, I'm not going into details about it. But anyhow, family is to be founded. Uh, I mean the discussion or the presentation of family and also family conflicts are presented in this novel in great details. Today when we think of uh, Pubak, we think of this novel, that is the first novel of the Good Earth Trilogy. Uh, however, in this novel, one thing uh, I would like to say is Wang Long's marriage. Wang Long is the hero of uh, the novel. His marriage with Ola is one example of arranged marriage. Arranged. And this is uh, <clears throat> one of the features about Chinese, traditional Chinese families. Okay? The marriages were arranged by the parents and even uh, some relatives. <clears throat> Well, their marriage is arranged by their father and old mistress of the house of Huang. He is a poor farmer, that is, Huang Long is a poor farmer. Therefore, he cannot afford to get married with a maiden from a decent family. Well, what remains for the poor like him are only slaves. So when his father says that he's going to find a slave, neither too young nor pretty, he becomes unhappy and even mutinous. Yeah. So this is uh, the kind of... Uh, you know, reaction or response, response on the part of Wang Long. But anyhow, finally we know the marriage is, uh, you know, consummated, right? It is, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the marriage was arranged by his father and also the mistress of the house of Wang, uh, uh, from which, you know, Olan stayed. Uh, okay, so this is one example, right? 
Uh, also, Purbach described arranged, family, arranged marriage in East Wind, West Wind, pavilion of women, the first wife and other stories, and so on. Uh, because she wrote a lot of uh, novels and also short stories of Chinese uh, you know, uh, subject matter. So in, do in so doing, she did not suggest that arranged marriage was more recommendable. Uh, Purbach was not doing that, was not suggesting that. It, it is true that before Wang Long diverse himself in the town flower house, that is with Lotus. Uh, he and Oline do live a very happy life. At the very, the, in the first part of uh, the novel, we know that. We have a lot of scenes, even the movie scenes, we can uh, uh, see that very clearly. So before, uh, you know, before Wang Long takes uh, Lotus home, <coughs> he and Oline do live a happy life. And that there is no not without concern or love between them. But their happiness should not be regarded, in my opinion, as the outcome of the arranged marriage. It is not uh, Perbach's suggestion. Instead of defending the traditional Chinese marriage system, Perbach was illustrating that the fruits of industry. Wang Long and Olan, they worked very hard. Very hard, very industriously. So it is uh, you know, the result of uh, industry. And also cooperation between the couples. Yeah between Wang Long and Olan. Uh, we know a lot of details from that, that novel, right? And uh, Wang Long and Olan, they are typical of uh, Chinese farmers. So this is one, uh, one illustration uh, about uh, the arranged marriage. Of course, in the novels, we have some other cultural elements, uh, Chinese elements, like bound feet, right? Bound feet. Uh, Pebak also portrayed that uh, in details. But again, uh, she didn't, uh, I mean, Pubak doesn't uh, portray that to advocate that. She only wanted us, uh, especially readers in the Western countries, or even those uh, in, in China, in traditional China, to see this kind of practice more objectively, to see, to understand it, to put it in the historical background. At that time, if, uh, if a girl is, does not have, uh, <coughs> you know, bound feet, uh, it's impossible for her to have some happiness. At, this, at that time, uh, you know, it was impossible for them to get educated. So where is the way out? Yeah. So Pu Buck, uh, in her introduction to Chinese cultural element, elements, she very much wanted us to see the historical context. Yeah, so that is the very important thing. Uh, every cultural practice has its reason of existence. That is the so-called raison d'etre uh, of uh, the cultural practices. Uh, maybe sometimes from the outside, uh, we say it is improper, right, to bind the feet of uh, you know the girls. Uh, but that is a historical phenomenon. If we want to understand it, we have to approach it from the historical perspective, uh, <clears throat> in order to see the cons and pros uh, of that kind of practice. Okay, so this is what I want to emphasize in my, uh, in my topic, in my thesis. Okay, uh, the second inspiration today we can get from Pu Buck's writings is that <clears throat> she interprets Chinese culture in her non-fictional writings also. Not only fictions, but also non-fictional writings. Uh, so in my opinion, uh, Pu Buck is also a kind of uh, scholar. She is a writerly scholar. She's a scholar from on the, you know, in the writer's uh, sense. Because in her writings of non-fictions, uh, we know she deli delivered a lot of uh, speeches in her lifetime. And also uh, she published a lot of, uh, you know, uh, collections, yeah. In these writings, she interpreted Chinese culture. Uh, Pu Buck not only presented Chinese cultural elements in her fictions, but also interpreted them in her non-fictions by direct or indirect comparisons and dialogues with Western cultures. So, you know, uh, of course, according to uh, Paul Doyle, Pu Buck is bifocal. <coughs> bifocal. Uh, she could examine the same phenomenon from the Eastern point of view and also from the Western one. Yeah. So, uh, very often she made a lot of comparisons. In a certain way, she uh, of course, maybe it's uh, improper for me to say that she is a scholar of uh, comparative culture or comparative literature. But actually, she made a lot of uh, comparisons of different cultures 
uh, especially Chinese and American cultures, right? Chinese culture and American culture. So today, when we think of uh, comparative literature, we also think of Pubak in China, uh, maybe not in some other countries. Yeah. So the kind of interpretations are very impressive. Her interpretation of Chinese culture through dialogues are represented by in many of her speeches. And uh, one of the well knowns uh, is, is there a case for foreign missions? Uh, a lot of us are very familiar with this uh, speech, uh, which is uh, very, very uh, uh, impressive. It is a very, uh, very good example. Well, these speeches, together with uh, some of uh, other non-fictional writings, spanning the years from the 1930s to the early years of the 1970s, so 40 years, four decades, right, uh, of writing of non-fictions, uh, <clears throat> are later published with the title, China as I see it, China, as I see it, yeah, this is a collection of all these essays and speeches, most of them. Yeah, it is a selection. Well, in that collection, we have one title that is The Land and the People of China. The Land and the People of China. Well, in it, <clears throat> this one is uh, very thought-provoking because her discussions about the modern Chinese democracy embodies the dialogical consciousness. So there is a sense of dialogicality in this uh, you know, piece. She said, when Chinese modern democracy develops, it will be in its own form, not like that of the Americans, but within its form, it will contain the opportunities necessary for the life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, which all people crave. So the same democracy, but different contents, maybe different, say, uh, forms, right? Well, uh, it, is not, it is rational or reasonable for her to think this way, right? For democracy, in my opinion, is desirable for all, right? But occupying, but copy, copying others in a blind way will only lead to harmful results to the indigenous culture. Before any of her speech, she expressed her absolute confidence in the Chinese. They have too much sense. They are not weak. They are not decadent. Chinese people on the land are strong and resilient and practical. Nothing can destroy them. Only folly can ignore them. Only stupidity and ignorance can despise them. Well, this is more or less the summary of her impression of the Chinese people and also the culture. Yes. Okay, yes. So, uh, in her non-fictions, she interpreted Chinese cultures, uh, cultural elements, yeah. And also, uh, the final part, that is uh, part three of my uh, presentation, is disseminate, disseminating Chinese culture among American common people. Well, this is, to me, very important, a kind of uh, you know, strategy. Yeah. Well, with China, Chinese culture and social reality, Pupak has had a relatively in-depth familiarity. Although she once said that she only interpreted that part of China she knew, she regarded herself as a very, uh, you know, a, a, a person very familiar with uh, China and the Chinese people. But at the same time, <clears throat> she tried to find a lot of helpers. For example, the first one is uh, Lin Yutang. Uh, I think you know this guy, right? Lin Yutang. Uh, Buck introduced him and also helped him in his publica publication of the book, My People, My Country and My People, and also the importance of living. In these two books, some basic Chinese cultural elements are introduced. So this is the first effort to me. A lot of efforts. The second is founding the East, the East and West Association. Right. This is also very important. She tried to find some common people from some artists, writers from Asian countries and ask them to uh, work in groups, sometimes in solo, right? Uh, they go to different homes of uh, common American people to introduce Chinese culture, so on, right? Uh, to familiarize them with Chinese cultures. So this is also a very important, also very effective measure or effort on the part of Pubak. And, and also, uh, she helped a lot. She helped the editing of Asia a lot, the magazine of Asia. At that time, in the 1940s, especially, uh, Asia was a very, very important uh, issue or magazine of uh, international stature because it covered a lot, lot of reports about Asian countries, about China, uh, so very influential. 
uh, per buck uh, helped a lot of people to publish their articles and essays in this magazine, including those articles by uh, Song Qingling, right, uh, Mao Zedong, right, the autobiography of uh, Mao Zedong, and also the most important one is Restart Over China. It was first published in a series in this famous magazine, uh, that is the uh, Asian magazine. Uh, so in these efforts, Pu Buck tried her best to disseminate to spread Chinese culture among American common people. Right. So to sum up, sum up <clears throat> what I want to say is today we can learn a lot from Pu Buck if we want to uh, uh, have other people to understand uh, a culture. For example, when Chinese culture, uh, if we want Chinese culture and literature to go, to go abroad very smoothly, it is necessary to introduce uh, these cultures in fiction, non-fiction, and also uh, it's uh, also very important to let common people, those common people, understand the basic, uh, you know, cultural elements. I think uh, if we can do these in a very comprehensive way, uh, it is, the fact would be very, uh, very, very uh, ideal. Yeah. So these are some of the basic ideas of my uh, my uh, paper. Okay. Thank you so much for your attention.